Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Mindful Social Chat, where we talk about how we can be more mindful with how we use social media or not. And this week, I've got Arno Michaelis, and he's really an amazing person that I met, oh gosh, a couple of years ago, I guess, through my project Human Journey and the Forgiveness Challenge with Desmond Tutu and his team. And I'm so excited to be able to bring you on the show because I can't think of any time that we more need your message than we don't have to be like this. We can change who we are. We can find ways to find our heart and compassion. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about you, Arno, and your background and your story? Yeah, happy to, Janet. Thanks so much for having me on today. And and I, I, I do need to make it clear that um, the message I I bear is really a universal one that's been around since uh, human beings first emerged out of Africa 200,000 years ago, I believe, which is that all human beings are uh, worthy of compassion. We have an innate need for it and an ability to give it. And that, that's something that's universal to all kinds of human spirituality. It, it's certainly not my message uh, personally, but it is one that uh, resounds with me very much uh, and is um, very apropos to the, the journey that's brought me from being a leader and organizer of hate groups back in the early 80s and 90s to uh, today, where I'm very honored to work with a man named Pardeep Kalika, who lost his father in the Sikh Temple shooting of August 5th, 2012. Uh, the fourth anniversary of that is coming up on Friday. Pardeep and I run an organization called Serve to Unite, which is about creative service learning and global engagement. And we bring uh, primarily young people, but really people of all ages together from uh around here in Milwaukee and also all over the world to, to see each other as human beings and to practice service for other human beings and to express ourselves artistically while we're doing it and, and to kind of witness the, the interdependence of, of life in the process. So you do a lot of work with kids, as you said. How do you explain to kids, um, how do you explain, explain these concepts to kids? Is it something that comes naturally to them? Yeah, I, I, I think it really does. Um, I, it's interesting that the, the younger, the, the person you work with, the, the more grasp they have of the, the very simple truths, I, I believe, that, that really apply to all human beings. One of which is that we speak of quite often is, is just that hurt mm -hmm. people hurt people. And uh, fortunately, that doesn't mean that all hurt people hurt people. Um, for the majority of people who suffer, there's a, a healthy means of processing that suffering, be it through family or spirituality or the arts or sports or you know, a, a, an infinite number of ways that we can kind of come to terms with our own suffering without passing it on to people. But for people who do hurt other people, I believe that no matter who we're talking about, it comes from a place of suffering. I, I don't believe that any happy, well-adjusted human being would have any reason to hurt mm -hmm. someone else. And young kids get this. I mean, that, it's, it's pretty elementary to them. And uh, we learn absolutely as much from our students as, as they may learn from us. And, and in that sense, we're, mm -hmm. we're students as well. Can you give us some examples of things that you've learned from your students? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think my my favorite story of learning from our students uh, came very early on in, in Serve to Unite. Uh, we started in April of uh, 13, at least as far as the, the school effort goes, which is what Pardeep and I do. There are um, a number of other people involved in Serve to Unite who uh, organize our 6K run walk every year. We're doing our fourth annual one of those uh, this Saturday where we raise scholarship money for uh, college-bound high school seniors, giving away six scholarships in honor of the six lives that were lost, and, and in that way, continuing those lives and, and the lives of these young people. But when Pardeep and I started our effort working with uh, kids in, in really grades 3 through 12 uh, back in April of 13, 
we uh, initially had two schools involved in our pilot. One was uh, Westside Academy, which is in the inner city of Milwaukee. The other was Fernwood Montessori, which was in a, a more affluent part of the city. And it was, um, it was a really beautiful thing to kind of defy the segregation that has plagued Milwaukee for so long by bringing the kids from these two schools together. Uh, kids that you know typically would not have had a chance to meet and have conversations did come together through Serve the United, serving other communities. Um, so one thing I think we learned was the, the, the bravery and the possibility that young people see. They're, they're not daunted by things that, that may cause an adult to say, oh, that can never happen, that can never be done. They, they have such beautiful imagination and they're so connected to it that um, that they're not going to be afraid to try something that uh, other people might be, that, that grown people might be. But the particular story that comes to mind is uh, at Fernwood, when we started in April 13, uh, the idea was we were going to connect our students with our, our global mentors, which are really amazing peacemakers from all over the world. And uh, we were going to ask the students to kind of conceive and um, go through the process with projects that were inspired by a global mentor. And uh, the person we were working with back then was a really amazing woman named Phyllis Rodriguez. Uh, Phyllis lost her son, Greg, in, in the 9-11 attacks and later on befriended a woman named Aisha Wafi, who is the mother of uh, Zacharias Musasi, who is the 19th hijacker. He was the, kind of the one person in custody that 9-11 was, could be pinned on. And so as the world called for his head, Phyllis said, uh, I don't want another mother to go through what I've went through. And, and I don't think that um, him dying is going to make me feel any better about losing my son. And Phyllis was really instrumental in, in helping um, Aisha cope with uh, what her son was going through. And um, the, the relationship that those two developed is really a beautiful thing. So my idea was we we're going to share Phyllis's story with our students at Fernwood, they were going to conceive projects inspired by that. And then we would kind of help them along with these projects and publish them. And uh, then I, I had some speaking gigs booked and I basically spent the entire month going on gigs literally from coast to coast, from California to New York. And when I came back, Party had been working with the Fernwood kids. And I said, oh, hey, how, you know, how, how's it going? And he said, hey, it's going great. We got like 20 groups of kids and they have all these projects going on and they're really into it. It's going fantastic. And I said, oh, cool. Well, how'd they like Phyllis's story? And he's like, oh, I, I didn't tell him Phyllis's story. Like I just asked them what they were concerned about in the world and they kind of went and conceived artistic and, and PSA projects to address it. So I'm like, okay, well, well, we can kind of like retrofit this, so we'll we'll introduce them to Phyllis's story now, and um, they can kind of draw the the threads of, of how this story of forgiveness and reconciliation applies to whatever their project was. And so, as we we introduced the kids to Phyllis's story, and I circulated around these twenty groups of kids, like listening to to them make the connection between things like bullying and forgiveness, and uh, racism and forgiveness or religious intolerance, homophobia. It was all very plain, it, you know, and it, it, it was easy for them to make, to say, well, this is why forgiveness is important in this case. And this is how we'll talk about it. And, and I was proud of them and really just amazed by their, their imaginations and their souls and their, their minds. And then I came to a group of um, seventh grade girls who had, conceived a project about my beloved Lake Michigan, which you see behind me here, um, it concerned about the pollution that it's facing, and, and they wanted to make do a project to raise awareness about that. And as they told me about it, they're all just like, like levitating. They're so excited, and they're so into this cause. And I was at a, a complete loss as to how to connect Phyllis's story to a project about raising awareness of pollution in Lake Michigan. And I, I said as much, and I'm like, you guys don't even worry about like Phil as a story. You just keep doing what you're doing. This is this is great. And one young lady, her name was Cece. She's like, well, Arno, actually, forgiveness has everything to do with environmentalism because if we can't forgive the polluters, they can't become wow. part of the pollution. 
And it was, <laughs> that was the point where I was just like, I'm not worthy. <laughs> you know, I, I was just like, you know, this this whole thing needs to be student um, mm -hmm. led and student run. And and really from that day forward, that that was uh, you know within the first few months of Surf Unite, and here we are now. Um, the 16, 17 school year will be our fourth uh, full school year of of uh, Surf Unite mm -hmm. in Milwaukee Public Schools. We're in the process of expanding internationally. We're, we have uh, like expansion projects in the works in um, Denmark, in the UK, in Brazil. And all along this theme of like letting our students lead the way and let them conceive and kind of guide our, our organization is, is one that uh, we're very happy so to stick with. Are you seeing this make change in the schools with the kids that aren't in the program? If you're seeing in the classroom with the kids that aren't in your programs, well, how is this affecting the school as, an, as a whole? Well, it's interesting. I, I, our, our our program is different in every single school, mm -hmm. and um, from school to school, we vary from like at at Fernwood Montessori, where we can just show up anytime we want and spend as much time as we want with the kids, which is amazing. Um, to other schools that have a much more rigid schedule, and you know, we got Tuesdays from one thirty to two twenty. Uh, but in every case, it, when we can, we like to have Serve Unite be a kind of voluntary thing, like a, a club kind of thing. And the way we cut, we kick it off is Pardeep and I go do a talk, and, and I talk about how people practicing kindness help to, to guide me from being a, a violent racist to where I am today. And Pardeep talks about how helping other people has helped him heal uh, begin and, and continue the healing process from his father being murdered by a white supremacist. And mm -hmm. then we asked the kids like, Hey, who's with us? And most of the people, most of the kids raise their hands. Not, not all of them do, but it's been, um, our experience that after Serve Unite has been going for a couple months in the school, the kids who didn't raise their hand initially are like, Hey, could I come do Serve Unite too? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they, they see that their peers, uh, having a lot of fun and, and they, I think uh, most importantly, they see their peers being empowered mm -hmm. by helping other people. Um, when we serve others, we, we really cultivate a, a, a powerful sense of our own self-worth and, and our value as, as human beings. And when we value ourselves and, and we have a genuine love for ourselves, it, it really leaves no room for hate for other people. Uh, in that individual's heart. That was definitely the, the story for me, um, leaving hate groups. And so it, it's been our experience that in the schools where Serve to Unite is uh, running, our, our Serve to Unite peacemakers like really take that identity seriously and, and they see themselves as, as people who uh, interrupt violence in their mm -hmm. school. So when, you know, rumors are percolating that there's going to be a fight or something like that. Our Serve Unite kids are the ones that go, hey, you know, fighting stupid, man. Why do you want to do this? Uh, you guys don't need to. And, and, and they, they've been breaking up fights in their school. They've been um, speaking out about issues that concern them in their communities and in the world. And when they express themselves artistically and express themselves through service to address these issues, they feel empowered to, to kind of guide the change process that's happening continuously all around us in a positive direction. And uh, for a young person, that's, that can be life-saving in mm -hmm. addition to the transformational in our society. So I know it might be kind of early for this, but you know, talking to the kids in the, in the coming year with as much as we've got going on with the elections, and kind of the upswing in, you know, just violence against people we don't understand around the world. Are you creating a project for that? Are you creating curriculum around that? Uh, our, our, we, we still don't have like a set mm -hmm. curriculum, like, hey, this is SDU curriculum. We really kind of like, we, we do address things on the fly. The past couple of years, um, the, the, chasm between uh, police and community in our inner cities has been a huge concern. And um, it, at our students' uh, guidance and um, with 
especially with Hardy's background as a Milwaukee police officer, we've been able to partner with the Milwaukee Police Department and get students and police officers together in the classroom to really ask the, the police anything they want. And, and our, our police officers have said that they've faced some of the toughest questions they've ever faced in this process. And um, it, it's really an amazing thing to see uh, young students, particularly students of color, comfortable enough with a, a police officer to, uh, to say, hey, are, are, are police mm -hmm. racist? You know, why do police shoot unarmed black people? And, and to see police officers, many of them people of color, uh, answer from their hearts and answer uh, what, what they believe and, and answer with, with authenticity. And um, these conversations, I believe, are absolutely crucial to address the, the violence um, that happens between police and community and, and to bring it to a point where uh, we, we're, we're actually in a position to minimize it. it, it not, not to minimize it happening, but I mean, not to minimize the exposure of it, but to minimize the, the incidents where that happens and, and have a healthier relationship between police mm -hmm. and community. Mm -hmm. And it must carry through to the parents as well that, you know, the kids bring this home with them. They bring it into their community, not just at school, but, you know, the community at large. So those relationships, as you can expand those, is hugely powerful. Yeah, absolutely. We, we had a, a fantastic response from parents and from early on, from that first year with our pilot program, we've had uh, parents of our students like hitting us up going, hey, this is amazing. Well, how can I get involved? Uh, how can I volunteer? So we've had uh, parents um, serving as volunteers at our events. We've had uh, parents spearheading fundraising efforts, as well as uh, connecting us with other organizations and uh, with other kids uh, from around the world. Okay, so I'm going to ask a little hardballer question then. Is more, you know, when you go into, go yeah, go for it. When you, when you go into a class that, you know, you haven't been in before, and let's say that you encounter um, kids or teachers or parents or cops that have a lot of, animosity and they're not happy people they're angry they want to lash out they don't want to listen to what you have to say my question is how do you deal with them and then how do you teach kids how to deal with those people when they encounter them in their lives yeah and, and we do we do face a, a an amount of that um after the success of our pilot the school superintendent of milwaukee public schools at the time uh, Dr. Thornton kind of came to us and said, hey, look at guys in this school, this school, this school. And, and uh, now we went from having a voluntary program to like, hey, these are the kids that really need your help. Go go turn things mm -hmm. around there. And, you know, a lot of those kids are, are really going through some struggles. And when, when you're struggling and, and when you're going through a rough time in life, it's sometimes it seems very counterintuitive to be like, how, how am I supposed to go help somebody else? Like, I need help. I'm having a problem here. But the first thing we do really is listen to them. Um, try to give them a platform and let them know that uh, if, if they're struggling, we're here to help. And that, uh, especially with Party's message of, of how, really, not just how he's uh, processed the, the murder of his father by a white supremacist, but really his family in general which came here uh, to Milwaukee from the Punjab in India like 30 years ago with absolutely nothing, uh, $35 to their name, none, none of them speaking English, and through a, an unbelievable dedication and uh, work ethic and discipline, over a period of 30 years, they literally like achieved the American dream. They, they got a nice house in the suburbs. They had founded a religious community of thousands of people. They had a, a thriving small business. And um, to, to, for someone who's struggling to see someone else who's overcome those struggles and who has brought themselves to a position where they can help other people through struggles is, is really a powerful thing. And, and we don't necessarily like uh, draw a picture about it because I, I think it's important for for people to see this and then they make the connection mm. to say, Hey, look what this guy has, has accomplished. Um, look how he 
rose above the, the, the challenges that he faced, maybe I can do that too. And, and sometimes that, that uh, connection isn't apparent right away, or, or sometimes the acknowledgement isn't apparent right away. And um, I, I kind of look at my history to illustrate that concept in that every thought we have as a seed, every action that we, we kind of uh, bring to the world as a seed, and, and these seeds can be cultivated and uh, can, can lead to, to good things, they can lead to bad things. And, and when we're mindful of, of that seeding kind of truth, the, the truth of cultivation, um, we can be more conscious of, conscious of the uh, kind of potential for our actions to, to either do harm or to heal people. And I, I really make a point of talking about seeding because in, in my history, it was really acts of kindness by people that I claim to hate that helped me to turn my life around. But some of those acts of kindness, some of these seeds, in some cases took seven years to, to even show that they were there. So, I, you know, I spent many years like doing my best to rip these seeds out and to pretend they never were planted and to deny them being there. But ultimately, the, the human conscience and the human experience doesn't work in terms of subtraction. Once something happens, it's, it's part of us and it's part of our experience going forward. So we can't like delete things that have happened. We can't pretend that, that they never happened to us. And for that reason, um, for better or worse, these, these seeds can change us sometimes years and years down the road. So when we're working with a student who's really facing challenges and who, who is lashing out, um, and we talk quite often about this with educators as well, uh, many of whom are, are facing incredible challenges themselves dealing with the whole class. Oh, we're going to lose you again. Like a lot of times it, when you're not mindful of how you're feeling right now, you tend to just experience the emotion and go with it. Do you do you incorporate any um, mindfulness training or awareness training in what you work with kids? Yeah, actually, I, I'm a Buddhist and I, I meditate regularly, and I, I we talk about meditation quite a bit. We, we've also brought people into our classes to. Uh, teach meditation. Um, we, we do quite a few mindfulness exercises. I, I think the simplest one that we do and, and kind of introduce and keep coming back to, which uh, uh, is, is very widespread and I'm very happy about that, but it's basically just the concept of, of taking a breath. So it, when, it, you know, an incident happens that, that is going to, uh, has the potential to kind of lead you by the nose, that just that moment of taking a breath in response to this incident gives you some space. It gives space between your mind and the experience itself, and it allows you uh, uh, just enough time to understand that you you actually have more control of this situation than mm -hmm. you might think. And um, I, I fully understand that that's much easier said than done. Uh, I and I, I understand that because I practice it myself on a daily basis um i as i grew up and, and as i was involved in hate groups uh, up until i was about 25 uh, that it for the bulk of the first 25 years of my life i i was a very violent person and i was mm -hmm. conditioned to respond to conflict with violence and here i am i i haven't put my hands on somebody in violence since new year's eve uh going from 95 to 96 when I, I hit a white mm. guy in a bar for uh, using the n-word so it was kind of like a milestone in that sense as to what was inspiring my violence but I it, you know it's, so it's been uh, 21 years since I, I hit somebody but because of all that conditioning earlier in my life that knee-jerk response have, like, yeah that, sure. <laughs> that spark I do. So, it, it, and not, nowadays, it's it's really like when I see people um, endangering other people, and I see people be, being disrespectful. Um, if I see somebody driving like a maniac, <laughs> I you know I, I just have that. I'm like, oh, I, I get angry, and I, I have that 
I have that spark where like I want I want to get you know mm-hmm. just for a split second like I want to be violent, but then I I take a breath and I remind myself, um, just depending on the situation. For instance, driving like I have no idea why somebody might be driving like a maniac. They might be doing it because they're completely careless and thoughtless. They also might mm-hmm. be doing it because um, their kids in the hospital, or you know so they're they're late. And they're if they're late one more time, they're going to lose their job. Like I, I have no idea what what the story is behind this action and I, and taking a breath allows me to remind myself of that. And once I remind myself of that, it kind of diffuses my, my instant go-to thing. Like, Oh, that guy's doing it just because he's a jerk. Like, I don't know why he's doing it. So Mm -hmm. let's why make a story up about him being a jerk. Um, And and I, I share this, this process. It's it's a practice for me. It's something I do every day. And sometimes I, I don't do it successfully. Sometimes I, I say things that are hurtful to other people. Sometimes that anger comes out. And um, that doesn't mean that's okay because it's a practice. I, I still need to be accountable for that. I need to apologize and ask for forgiveness, which I, I do. But um, it's, it's ultimately good news because now I, I'm a pr- practitioner. I'm not sitting on some mountain, you know, like some supreme being who's solved all his own problems. Like I, this is something I deal with every day. And therefore, I, I can relate to people who, who are maybe mm. uh, just beginning. Mm. To, to yeah, and they, you know, the taking a breath and just checking in. Okay, I'm angry. Why am I angry? Instead of just going, I'm angry. <laughs> Which, exactly. you know, and, and I have a pretty <laughs> right. good temper too. So, you know, especially for some reason, driving, <laughs> it's like an outlet for me. Road rage is a big deal for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it, it's it's really a <laughs> challenge sometimes when you feel that adrenaline rush. What are you going to do with it? You know? Right. Yeah. And, and it's, it's uh, um, it, again, it's, it's uh, I, I look at it kind of like a gym. You know, you, if if you're working out and you're you want to get in shape, you go to the gym as a place to like stress your body physically, to to push yourself outside of your comfort zone, so that you mm-hmm. can come back stronger than you were before. And and if you look at any kind of stressful situation in, in that context, it can really help us take advantage of it and um, see it as an opportunity rather than just an obstacle mm-hmm. or, or just an obligation. And I, I, that's one of many, many things I've learned from Pardeep Kalika, who um, really embodies that that uh, that spirit of relentless optimism, which in the Sikh faith is called Chardikala. That it's basically the, the, the outlook that no matter what's happening to you personally, no matter what's happening in the world, um, it's, it's a beautiful place. It's, it's a, a, something to be grateful for. And that if, if you have a, a very deep, faith in that beauty of life and in that gratitude that there, there's nothing that can shake that there's there's no nothing no one no experience that can take that away from you and um party has demonstrated that in such an amazing way since august 5th 2012 as has the entire sick community and that's something i've been incredibly inspired by and it, that's something that we we share with our students um we share that inspiration and they kind of reflect it back to us and then we see uh, young people going through incredible struggles, but really making the decision to see that struggle as, as something that's um, going to make them uh, a, not, not necessarily a stronger person, but, but a more um, in person who's more engaged with the world around them and, and who's uh, seeing the struggle as, as something to be grateful for and as something that can bring them to a place mm-hmm. where they can Absolutely. help other people. And I think, you know, this what you just said brings something up in me and that, you know, we have a choice as a society to hang out with people who feel that way. You know, and the more times you hang out with people who really are generous and conscious and giving and don't have that negativity, it's a whole lot easier for you not to have it too. I don't think that we should ignore people who are negative. We, we need to find ways to help. But I think, you know, the more you realize there are more people out there who don't react in a negative way and don't respond with violence, that gives us a huge opportunity to expand that circle and, you know, help that that seed grow. What, um, 
we kind of missed the part about working with the teachers because you dropped off. So can we go back to that for just a minute and talk a little bit about, sure. you know, teachers in, in inner city schools have, have a lot of challenges to deal with. How can we, how do they manage and how can we help them manage better? Well, if we could clone party of Kalika, we'd, we'd have our education issues solved. <laughs> Uh, Party after he was a police officer, uh, he became a high school teacher at a school called Nova Academy in Milwaukee. And um, Nova's a, a school where you know kids who were having problems in other schools often end up. And when Party was teaching there, uh, he was he was like the last resort teacher. So these other teachers who couldn't handle a kid, they'd be like, "Get." go to Kalika's class. Like, <laughs> I can't even deal with you. And so it, it, he, his class was always, and you know, already at high capacity, but he, he never said no. He, he would every single time, it, every kid was welcome in there. And, and even if it was a kid who was having a really rough day, Party would, would have the kind of the, the, the calmness to, to sit and not let his class be shaken by um, the, the suffering that the one student was expressing. And again, it's something that's much easier said than done, but it, it, important things that, that I've learned from party as a teacher is, is first and foremost to learn every kid's name, just do do your best to, you know, it's a very concrete, it's a very uh, practical uh, bit of advice. And what, what it, it results in is, is an engagement with each kid. So when you can say, hey, you know, you know that kid's name, you know their, their story, you know what's going on in their, their home life, you know what they're coming from, you know what they're dealing with. Uh, just knowing all those things is going to really increase your ability to engage with this student. Um, it, it, you don't necessarily have to have a solution. And, and more often than not, you're not going to. Um, we're, we, we deal with kids who uh, don't get enough sleep at night, who don't have a, a safe place to sleep, who don't get enough to eat, who are, who are having like really basic uh, life needs that aren't being met. And, and as teachers, we, we don't have the capacity to snap our fingers and solve these problems. But just being aware of the problems is a huge thing. Just being able to say to the student, like, I, you know, I know, I know you're going through some really rough times right now. Um, I can't necessarily solve your problems for you, but I can let you know that when you're here at school, I'm here with mm -hmm. you too. And, and that together, you know, I, I want to help you learn. I, I want to give you an outlet from uh, the, the challenges that, that you face and an outlet to, to meet those challenges and even surpass them. Um, that, that intent and that authenticity is a, is a really powerful thing. And um, again, going back to, to cultivation truth and, and knowing that you'll have conversations with students like that and they, they will seem to absolutely not give mm -hmm. a shit about it, <laughs> to, to be like completely cut off and say, whatever, I'm not hearing anything you say, to, to know that, that your authenticity is planting seeds and that it is being, it is getting through, even if it doesn't seem like it, and they have faith in that. Is, is a really, um, it, it's, I, I believe it's a survival skill for, for teachers. I think without the ability to do that, um, you're, you're not going to be as successful as you could be. That's really huge because, you know, I think it, it can be so deadening sometimes to encounter, I mean, I have a 16-year-old son and, and we're very fortunate that he's got a lot of really great friends and they're great kids, but you know, he comes home with stories about just conflicts that happen, you know, and, and there's constantly conflicts and there's teachers that people don't like and teacher, teachers who are exhausted by that kind of daily inundation of nobody's really paying attention to me. And, you know, finding a way to let them know that, yes, they've been heard. Uh, they may not know that for 10 years when that student comes back and says, wow, you changed my life in seventh grade. Uh, you know, that's, Absolutely. it must be amazing. It never happened to me, but it must be amazing. <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, it, it, and when you're, we're dealing with uh, young people, especially in middle school and high school, um, it, it's so important to understand that, that suffering is, is entirely relative 
And that it, especially when you're going through puberty, you know, these hormonal changes going on and the world seems to be in complete chaos and, and everything is just such a catastrophic big deal. You know, you're, I, with my daughter, I'm just like, she went through a lot of struggles being bullied and, and uh, which was a kind of a cold irony. And I was a bully growing up. So now my, my daughter was bullied as she grew up and, and I kind of experienced what it was like to be a parent of some, a kid who was bullied and experience how helpless you feel and, and how much it hurts to see your child hurting. And, and to, to understand that, that, that everyone's, uh, in, in their own battle everyone's in their own journey and and it's um we have a tendency as, as human beings to want to kind of rank things and to say well that that suffering is far more devastating than that suffering and um you know oh that person has it much better than that person but the, the truth is the suffering is entirely relative and and that it doesn't hurt any less uh, because of your, your circumstances in life. It doesn't hurt any more because of your circumstances in life. To, to just really get down to that simple truth that it just plain hurts. And, and that, you, that compassion is boundless. And, and that um, you know, having compassion for a person in circumstance A doesn't leave us with any less compassion to have for someone in circumstance B. I, I think that's a very important thing. And, and that, that's something that comes up in schools because um, in our society, we tend to say, well, you know, the kids in the inner city schools who, who's their suffering is, is something we need to pay more attention to than uh, the kids who are suffering in, in the cushy suburban school. When the fact is, is these, these kids in the suburban school going through puberty, go, being a teenager, um, it, they're not aware of, of uh, starving kids wherever else in the world. They're, they're aware of their own suffering. And, and it's, to, to connect their suffering with the suffering of others is really the, I believe the, the proper path to that, because that's how we cultivate more compassion in our society to say, yeah, you know, I, I know you're going through suffering. These other kids are too. And, and so maybe if you guys can help each other out and, and you can say, you know, dedicate yourself to, to helping others, someone else who's suffering, it's going to help you heal and help you prevail through the suffering you're going through rather than trying to rank it and, and, you know, having some sort of contest as to who's suffering most. My life sucks um, more than I, I think that that's a, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's, you know, it's hard not to do that when you're having a hard time. So I, I don't, I, I certainly wouldn't begrudge anyone who feels that way um, as most teenagers tend to do. You know, if you talk to any teenager, they're, they're, Oh, breaking up with this person, yeah. that's just the end of the world. <laughs> you know, like, but at the same time, you know, feeling um, unwanted, feeling un not valued, feeling excluded, uh, th these feelings are, are really hurtful. And, and if they're not processed in a healthy way, they, they can bring us to mm. some really rough places. Mm. Well, I think, uh, you know, let's, let's close with a little bit of information about how people can learn more about Serve to Unite. Uh, for those of you on the chat, the, the link is on the page and it's also on the website. But uh, Arno, you know, how can we help you and help Serve to Unite to reach more people? Uh, a, a huge thing that, that we always need help with is uh, sharing the work of our students on social media. Um, the, the age of social media that we live in, uh, you being a specialist in this, I, I'm sure you're well aware, but I, I, it's a, it's a, there's a ton of, of potential. And it's a potential for harm or it's a potential mm. for healing. And uh, unfortunately, um, we, we live in a time when if a kid goes out and films a, a fight in the playground at school and they throw it up on YouTube, uh -oh, it gets 10,000 views oh, the next day, pop in. If we had, if we had... <laughs> I'm sure everybody has seen those videos that the kids put up too. And, and I, they go all over Facebook. <laughs> yeah, and it's it, so we, we'll have kids who spend three months organizing a put down the guns event in the middle of the inner city, and we get a hundred views on it. So, mm. <laughs> it's, it, you know, the, the, the kids are getting a message like what gets more attention. Mm -hmm. So, something that all of us can do, everybody who's involved in social media, 
is um, and not just serve to unite, but find those positive stories that young people are doing. Let's blow that up. Let's let's really yeah. all all the energy that we want to spend going. Oh, look at all these horrible things that are happening. Look at this bad thing. Look how crazy Donald Trump is. Like let's <laughs> and and some of those things need to be pointed out. We can't put our heads in the sand and pretend that these bad things aren't happening. But we don't I, have to dwell in them. Right, exactly. We, we we don't have to to stew in them. And and I think if we put at least as much effort into uh, cultivating the good in our world as we mm-hmm. do to expose the bad, ideally more so. I I mean, me on social media, you'll very rarely see me go, "Oh, look at how horrible this is." Because I, we all know that horrible things happen in the world. I, I, I want to, I, I share things that inspire me of people who have like overcome horrible things happening to them in a positive way and have brought themselves to a point where they can help other people through that struggle as well. So if, if people want to help out Serve United, please uh, visit our Facebook page. That's kind of our primary uh, social media vehicle. Um, and also visit our website at serve2unite.org with the number two. You'll see a lot of our students' content there. If, if you share that content, you'll find the content that resounds with you. We have a ton of it. I'm sure something will. Share that on your social media and um, help to, to make uh, what really is beautiful about the human, human experience as more viral than, than what's bad about it. I, that, that's the best way people can help us. And, of course, um, you know, we're expanding. We, we always have way more schools that, that want us there than, than we have a budget for. So if people are in a position to support us financially, that's always hugely appreciated. And it's put to very, very good use. Um, not only does that get us into schools, but it helps us uh, take kids on field trips to get them involved in activities. Many of these field trips are getting kids from the suburbs and the inner city together. Uh, just riding on buses costs a lot of money. So um, financial help for Surf United is, is always a, a really big thing. Well, great. Well, I'll, we'll certainly do that. And and I, I can say that, you know, everything that you do share on social has been very inspirational to me. I really appreciated it because that's what I want more of in my world and a whole lot less of, okay, there's been you know, this horrible thing happens and these people are horrible. And, and all that does to me is keep that cycle moving. It keeps that, that wheel turning and we need to change the direction of that wheel. So I hope Absolutely. that, I hope that yep. people who listen Great to point. this will be sharing from Sh- Serve to Unite and don't forget, they can also get your book. Uh, where can they find you on uh, social media, on Twitter? Uh, on Twitter, I, I'm My Life After Hate, which is also the title of my book. Uh, the book's available on Amazon. And um, I'm on Facebook. I have a Facebook page for the book, for My Life After Hate. And people are always welcome to, to friend me up personally. I'm pretty uh safe to say i'm the only arno r michaelis the fourth on facebook so if you see me on there uh feel free to to reach out and say hi and and i'd love to connect and and that's the way that i I actually i do uh, quite a bit of networking and and bring a lot of uh in real life um activism to to the world is, is through social media social media is a powerful thing absolutely well, I really want to thank you, Arno, for coming on. And, uh, you know, we will definitely be spending more time sharing from Serve to Unite. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Janet. I, uh, when we connected with you initially to, to partner with the Human Journey Project, it was a, a really transformational thing for, for me personally and also for Serve to Unite. And to this day, we still uh, use the forgiveness recipe quite a bit in, in our uh, curriculum the curriculum that doesn't exist that <laughs> that's kind of like the, <laughs> the big thing is like forgiveness recipe let's do that and and uh we we continue to to uh share that with our students and and to learn from them in the process so thank you for everything that you do and uh looking forward to continued collaboration oh great well thank you i'm i'm glad that message came through because i i think desmond and ampa tutu are amazing in I what they too. teach I, huge huge heroes of mine yeah, me too. Okay, well, I'm going to let you go. And thank you 